colonialism is a tough one because it's you can look at the colonizers and mm-hmm. they had their they each had their period and faded great britain remained for a long time they and and then you can look at the colonies themselves and some of them went on to be massively prosperous and others never developed at all you touched on this before but that does make it look like colonialism as a factor had its moment it wasn't clear if it was the net positive or a net negative and today it's kind of faded what are the what are the what are the factors that have faded and what are the factors that are are intensified today and are they in such a shape that we should continue to expect progress or are there elements of weakening for institutions, for instance, and cultural elements. So I think the factors that have faded the most are those that might have made Europe prosperous. So something like you you hit on here, Spain had the biggest colonial empire for quite some time, yet its own internal institutions were really bad. You know, there were very few constraints on royal power, and they they squandered most of their colonial enterprise. Even you know, again, something you touched on Britain or you know later the Dutch. You know they had big, you know, and they had big colonial empires and were wealthy and, and certainly gained wealth from them. At least you know certain people gained, became fabulously wealthy because of the colonial enterprise. But the remnants of though of the colonial empires on the wealth of what we'll call you know the West or the wealthy world, those with with colonies, is relatively plays a relatively small role today in their wealth or the persistence the persistence of their wealth. The things that are with us, though, are the types of institutions and, frankly, even cultures, in some case, that emerged in the colonies. So there's been some very good work. Um, an economist, uh, Nathan Nunn, has done really good work on, say, sub-Saharan Africa, where he looks at the the remnants of the slave trade, and he finds that, well, he finds it several things. You know, I think a couple of the things that are most interesting that he finds is one that if you look at the parts of sub-Saharan Africa that really had a lot of slaves taken from it, you know, especially kind of that, you know, the kind of the Gold Coast area, um, you know, nor- kind of Northwest Africa, down to Angola, those places not only were were poorer in, say, like 1950 than, uh, than other parts of sub-Saharan Africa that had fewer slaves, especially in the East, taken from it, but th- there was divergence over the course of the latter half of the 20th century meaning there was something that was kind of continuing to keep those places poor. In his subsequent work, one thing he finds is that those places that had a lot of slaves taken from it still have a massive, massively low trust of others today, which is completely understandable because a big way that slaves were taken is in some cases, the the slave raiders were typically one African tribe against another African tribe, and then the African tribe would sell those slaves to the Europeans. So it's not just a mistrust of, say, Europeans, it's a mistrust of your neighbors as well, people outside of your kin group, outside of your ethnic group. And this is something, you know, it's completely understandable why those cultural norms would have emerged in the colonial period, and they seem to persist. So you know, one thing about culture, and one thing that makes it such a strong explanatory, has, has such, such explanatory power is that it tends to persist, you know, it passes over generations. And, you know, what you learn from your parents is often what you transmit to your your kids. Um, well, especially because yeah. there's one element that we didn't talk about that distinguishes this concept of economic growth. And that was the consistency, the persistence of economic growth over a period of time, yeah. which is what you delineated yeah. in the book. And and yeah. I failed to raise earlier, but that that's the key. And so you're trying to find those factors that have enduring yeah. impact. Yeah. Uh, yeah, for sure. That's right. And I mean, th- because the, the thing that sets the modern economy off and makes it different from any other period in economic history is the persistence of, of growth. So even if you look at something like, you know, look at U.S. growth from 1800 to 2000, if you look at the overall chart, you can see the Great Depression in there, but it's a blip. You know, the U.S. recovers and is is right right on track not that long after. Great recession, you know, a decade and a half ago, very similar thing. So this this is something where that's what needs to be explained, is the takeoff and the persistent takeoff. One thing that I think you know, you kind of hit on it at the beginning, you know, this disconnect between where the world is and people's views. I think on today, and yeah, you know, there's reasons to have or tomorrow. To have, 
Yeah. It's, it's like most people say, yeah, 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 we're okay today. Yeah. In, in 10 years, yeah. we're screwed. In, in 20 yeah, years, yeah, we're yeah. screwed. For sure. For sure. And I think, you know, so I think there's a few things to be said on this. And we get back to the question. So one is that when, you know, we call the book, How the World Became Rich. Yeah, you know, we fully understand the whole world's not rich, of course, even by, you know, not just by Western standards, by historical standards as well. But, but what we should say is that by historical standards, a large part of the world today is rich. So when we say rich, what we mean is something like $15 a day of per capita income. That's only like five, five, six thousand dollars $6,000, right? That's not a lot by what certainly you're, you know, if I'm, I'm assuming, you know, a good fraction of your listeners are probably in the US or, you know, in the, the West. That's obviously very low per capita income. This show is being brought to you by our sponsor, Truflation. Professional investors and economists and probably any casual observers know that government inflation statistics are only an approximation of what real inflation is. Not only that, but the government has a conflict of interest because high inflation can be so damaging to the economy, the deficit, and our $34 trillion in debt. Truflation collects over 13 million pricing data points, most are updated daily, to reveal inflation with precision for asset managers, governments, companies, and the general public. Check them out at truflation.com. But by historical standards, it's much, much higher than, you know, what was typically the three to four dollars a day, you know, around fifteen hundred dollars at most, absolute most. And in fact, that would have been very wealthy. Historically, you know, most people outside of a small set of elite were work very close to subsistence. And we have moved away from that. Now, there are still places in the world that are at subsistence. And there's really two uh, there's two overarching reasons why the, the poorest countries in the world are very, very poor. One is governance. So a place like North Korea is very, very poor. That's, that's just governance. And another one is, I, I think we can subscribe to some of the legacies of colonialism. Um, you know, like the Democratic Republic of Congo is one of the poorest countries in the world. And it faced one of the most vicious colonial enterprises under the Belgians that still has bad institutions, led to very bad you know, culture. And this was up through you know, early 20th century that really, I think, has made it tough for a place like that to escape. But for the most part, much of the rest of the world is so much better off than, you know, we have this map that I think when when I had the or when Mark and I had the idea to do this, I thought it would be a really telling map. It's one of the very first figures in the entire book. We look at the countries in the world that, and we have a map of the entire world, that are wealthier than Britain was in 1800. And the reason we chose Britain was because in terms of per capita income, it was the wealthiest country in the world in 1800. And with the exception of some parts of sub-Saharan Africa, you know, Afghanistan, North Korea, places where, you know, and, and a couple others, most of the rest of the world is wealthier than the wealthiest country was just 200 years ago. Now, I know 200 years might seem like a long time, but in the you know span of the, the long span of human economic history, it's really not. And for, you know, this is something where even though it's been somewhat slow, the, the, the entire most of the world has been has been brought up. And, yeah. and, and, and the percent of human population that lives at subsistence level and below is so much smaller today. So much smaller. It was something where, you know, the, our best estimates in around 1820 were around 90 percent. You lived on, uh, a, a, you know, less around a thousand dollars per year of, you know, modern day. Not, you know, this is all in real terms, just in case, you know, your, your listeners might be wondering about inflation. This is we, we're talking about this. We're talking about this all in real terms. So, you know, think about. 2024 uh, US dollars or something like that. You know, most people, about 90% of people lived around a thousand dollars of per capita income per year. Hey, if you like this clip, please hit the subscribe button. You might also want to check out some of the clips I've posted with my many other guests. My interviews all address the simple question, how screwed are we? We ask experts about the problems that make Americans so pessimistic today, but we also Explore why there's never been a better time to have been born than today. Join us for perspective on today's challenges and opportunities.